All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our CLPL this afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for waiting in the lobby there and for joining us midweek. Um, on late in December, it's definitely winding down time. Um, and yeah, it's just appreciate you joining here. Also, hello to everyone who's joining online uh, later on catching up. I uh, hope you find this session useful too. Uh, so this afternoon, we're going to be doing our science storytelling CLPL on space. Uh, and just before we get started, I've got a couple of housekeeping things to mention. I should also mention who I am, uh, but my name is James. I'm the Planetarium Assistant Manager here at Dynamic Earth. And just those two housekeeping things to mention, firstly, is just to note that we're recording this session today. Um, so that's just to share with others later on with teachers that can't make it just now. And this session will be a maximum of about 90 minutes long. So we're aiming to finish by about half past five. So with that out of the way. Oh, OK, I appear to have been muted for the whole thing. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, on that note, thank you so much for waiting patiently there uh, through the couple of minutes that I just waffled on while I was muted. And thanks to Connor online. For that. OK, so welcome to our science storytelling today, our CLPL, all about space. Uh, my name is James. I'm the Planetarium Assistant Manager here at Dynamic Earth. And there's a couple of housekeeping things just to mention before we get started with our session this afternoon. So firstly, this session is going to be 90 minutes long, a maximum of. Hopefully, we'll be finished by half past five today. And we're going to have some breaks in between, a couple of five minute breaks just to keep us sane. And then secondly, we'll have times for questions as well. So if you want to put any questions, anything at all in the chat during the session, we'll keep an eye on that as well. So our session today is sponsored by Education Scotland and supported um, through their Enhancing Professional Learning in STEM Grants Fund. So thanks to them. And there are also more sessions coming up each month. Uh, so we've got a few online sessions coming up. We've got Rumble in the Jungle. We've got some Puffin Power as well and Outdoor Rocks. So do try and attend as many as you can. Uh, they're all going to be a little bit different um, with a different aspect of storytelling each time. We've also got an in-person session coming up, uh, but you can check that out on our website that's linked on this slide as well. OK, so time to meet the team. So I mentioned that I'm James, I'm the Planetarium Assistant Manager. Uh, and then there's also another two of us. So we've got Dr. Alistair, Bruce, Ali here. There Hi. he is. <laughs> and we've also got Tony. There you go. So Tony is the Planetarium Officer. <laughs> Ali is the Planetarium Manager. And in a moment, I'm just going to hand off to Ali, who's going to give you a talk for about 25 to 30 minutes about his work and chat to you a lot about space. Then after that, we'll have a five minute break and I'll do a show for you called You Are Here, a bit of storytelling. Then after that, another five minute break and I'll hand off to Tony, who will chat to you about lots of space resources. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Alistair and I'll chat to you about space. Thank, Thank you very much, James. Thank you, Tony, as well. Uh, hello everybody, uh, how are you all doing? Uh, it's very nice to have you along with us today. Uh, so yes, my name's Ali, uh, I'm your astronomer for today, I am your expert. Uh, now, uh, the really nice thing about astronomy is it's a fantastic sort of gateway into the sciences in general. It gets listed alongside medicine as like one of the oldest, the oldest sciences on earth because we've been doing it ever since we could look up. Um, and so it's a great way of talking about anything, just what are we seeing up in the sky, up above our heads. Now, um, uh, just a little bit about myself before we get any further into it. I'm just going to show a few pictures here. Uh, so I originally trained as an actor straight out of high school. And uh, while I was acting, I started doing physics in my part time. Uh, usually around about this time of year, more than 10 years ago, I would have been in a pantomime. So that picture on the bottom right is what I used to do over Christmas. Um, but after in about 2012, 2013, I started my PhD in astronomy and I was working at the Royal Observatory right here in Edinburgh on Blackford Hill. And I was studying uh, really cool objects in space called quasars, uh, which are just sort of cosmic lighthouses, really distant, really active, really interesting galaxy cores that I can see uh, with the telescope that I was using on the island of La Palma. So fun times for me. 
Um, and yeah, so I've been doing sort of uh, science communication for quite a long time now. And this for me is it's kind of a fun way of sort of distilling uh, the last sort of 10 years of my life into this sort of storytelling aspect. Uh, and the game for me, I just sort of did a little bit of a, a brain dump here for you, because this just sort of uh, this is kind of the thing that I will try and do pitching anything perfectly I don't think it's possible it really depends on who you're with your audience how you're feeling at the time uh, there's loads of things in astronomy that are incredibly complicated but at the same time uh, there's a lot of uh, relatively simple stuff that we can start with and just sort of build up that picture uh, and one of my favorite answers is usually I don't know but it's going to be fun finding out so don't be afraid to say I don't know or well we think it's this but we're not entirely sure because um, there's huge amounts of things that we still don't know about the the universe but that right there makes it a very uh, future-proof career as well so um, it's definitely a fun one to do. Now um, just for me the, the first thing is to not panic uh, and if you don't know something there's plenty of resources and I would definitely recommend uh, Wikipedia is actually a wonderful resource uh, especially for spacey things there's lots of nerdy stuff about any one of the planets all the moons in the solar system there's lists upon lists of space missions and what they've been up to and access to lots of free imagery so there's a lot of stuff out there uh, but it can open up into a bit of a rabbit hole as well. Uh, keeping new words to a minimum, that goes for writing the science papers as much as it does for introducing new subjects. Uh, any new words you're going to introduce, just make sure everyone's on board with you uh, before you move further on. Repeating and pacing, definitely do useful things to do. I try and say the same thing twice, uh, but in two different ways, just to help reinforce what I want to talk about. Uh, the emotive, enthusiastic thing usually is helped by copious amounts of coffee, um, but it, it really comes across, I think, if you're passionate about the thing you're talking about, you get free energy for that and it sort of comes across and your listeners are going to get swept up in that enthusiasm with you as well. Uh, now this look for a hook thing, a little bit of a vague statement, uh, but from my point of view it's it's trying to find something so it's not just a single thing. I want to have something that's visual, maybe it's an audio thing, maybe it's something you're holding in your hand, maybe it's something you've been asked to imagine as you're saying the key thing that you want someone to remember. Because I could waffle for 10 minutes about something, but I might have an idea in my head of just that one thing I want you to come away with. So that hook is the moment I decide to drop that one thing that I care about. One nice example might be um, to do with meteorites. Now, these are the rocks that fall to Earth from space. But if I was going to hand somebody a meteorite in their hand, as I was doing it, I would say that rock is not from planet Earth. And that just you see the reaction and it just changes ever so slightly how they're then going to interpret that rock once it's in their hand. Um, think big, start small. Uh, for me, I can't really talk about quasars, the things that I spent five years of my life studying, uh, without having to talk about things like gravity and black holes first. I can't just jump in at the deep end. So you've got to have a bit of time and a bit of room uh, and that ties in with the layering as well so you just build up everything you want to see. Reading the room, uh, I used to do this with Panto as well, if you can tell you're losing your audience uh, you can sort of change tack a little bit and it just gives you a chance to be a little bit more reactive. The thing for me I never used to like seeing was people nodding off during planetarium shows um, but at the same time it's just nice to you know everybody's with you uh, on your story. Uh, the inclusive language thing, uh, I think people are getting better at doing this every day when it comes to saying things about uh, studying the universe, I always use the word we, and I would encourage all the people in our planetarium when we're delivering shows to always say we, we found this out, we found this out. Uh, and again, use sort of um, gender neutral terms as well. So instead of saying manned space flight, we're usually saying crude space flight. So just things like that to bear in mind as well, just to try and not leave anybody behind. Um, now, that's an, enough of my brain dump, because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the most useful thing uh, that I think I could teach anybody about. And this is because we have a planetarium here at Dynamic Earth and myself, James and Tony, we live in that space and it's our nice immersive bubble and we can put you under a simulated night sky. Now, we can't get you into the planetarium right now, but we can do the next best thing, and that is to use a piece of software called Stellarium. Now, the website is Stellarium.org. We'll put the link in the description of the video when it goes live. Uh, and I'm just going to start Stellarium here. So let me just stop my screen sharing here uh, and we'll change it up to this. And see if it's behaving itself. Ha ha. So we are now inside uh, Stellarium. So Stellarium is a free virtual piece of planetarium software that you can use on any computer. There's versions for Windows on the desktop. It works on Macs. It works on Linux. There's even a web-based version, slightly less powerful than the one that I'm showing you here. 
Um, and you can even get a mobile phone version of this, but I, I believe that's not free last I checked. So uh, I'm using here the Windows desktop version, but the lovely thing about Stellarium is it gives you a simulated sky straight away. The only thing you have to get right here is to tell it where you are. And uh, so I've got it set to Edinburgh. And the first thing you might want to do is have a look in the bottom left when you mouse over the control panels here. Uh, lots going on, and I would encourage you just to get in and explore. I'm going to show you some of the things that I frequently do with Stellarium, uh, but it's incredibly handy and it allows you to just solve mysteries, but you're doing it all by eye and you can be a bit more interactive with things. Now, the, the button up here in the top of the control panel on the left, that's the location window. So pressing that gives you a chance to set any location on Earth. If you want to stargaze from the South Pole, be my guest, uh, uh, but it will try and give you the most accurate sky it possibly can. Now, at the moment, we're looking towards where the sun has just set. Uh, and the reason Stellarium is actually so powerful is because you get full control with time. You can advance it forwards and backwards. Uh, I can reverse this to give us uh, what the sky was looking like earlier today. Uh, and I'm just going to make me slightly depressed here because uh, we're getting very close to what's called the winter solstice, which is when the sun is really low in our sky. So around about midday, the sun tends to be directly south from our vantage point here in Scotland. Uh, and look how low it is. That is as high as the sun gets on a winter's day in Scotland. It's incredibly low. It's only about 10 degrees above the horizon. That is about the width of your fists above the horizon at arm's length. So it's incredibly low, much, much higher during the summertime. And these are the seasonal changes that you can see play out in Stellarium as well. Um, now I'm just going to speed time on again and we'll get a simulated sunset here. And we'll get straight into some stargazing. Now, the biggest problem with stargazing is it's never going to be as good on a screen or in a planetarium as what you'll see with your own eyes. But you've got to work really, really hard these days to get to what we call dark sky sites. So places away from cities, away from any light pollution. Uh, you can't look at mobile phone screens. You can't look at car headlights uh, because your eye struggles uh, to adapt to the darkness if you keep looking at bright things. 15 minutes, half an hour under a very dark sky, and you'll hopefully be seeing views uh, a little bit like this. Um, now again, uh, Stellarium, I'm hoping you're seeing at least some stars on your screen here. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit and turn up the brightness of the thing I want to talk about next, which is our Milky Way. So I'm just going to go into one of the options here, turn up the Milky Way, make it five times brighter than normal. Let's see if this behaves. There we go. Um, so that's the Milky Way, and that's probably the most important thing I could ever show uh, a brand new person uh, under a starry sky because it's such a difficult thing to see with your own eyes. Most people in the UK, we live too near city lights. Uh, the city limits of Edinburgh, for example, you just can't see the Milky Way, but that is your home galaxy. And it arcs around us on the sky. Traces of circle all the way around us, and that's because our galaxy is shaped like a fried egg. We're about halfway out on the white bit of that fried egg, and as we're inside this fried egg, looking out through it in these directions, all in a sort of plane, we're seeing way more stars in those directions, and that's what you're seeing with the Milky Way on the sky. You can even make out dust lanes. The Milky Way is a very dusty place, uh, and that's in the way of some of that really distant starlight. Um, but this is where astronomy becomes uh, interesting because it's incredibly hard to do sizes and scales easily without melting brains. Uh, uh, people like uh, Brian Cox and myself are very guilty of saying the word billion without giving it any context. Um, so I'm just going to give you an idea of how to hold a billion in your head. Um, and it's to do with time. Uh, human beings were very good at using time. Uh, we can deal with seconds, with milliseconds, but we can also deal with decades and millennia as well. So there's a big stretch of space in there to play with. So if you want to count for a million seconds, that takes about 11 and a half days. If you were going to count for a billion seconds, that takes about 32 years. Now, to give you an idea of what we're seeing in the sky up above our heads, there's about 6,000 stars you can see with just your own eyes. There's a lot more than that out there, but there, that's about how many you can see uh, from any good vantage point on Earth. And you won't be able to see as much as 6,000 from Edinburgh, that's for sure. The Milky Way proper, we think, has a minimum of 200 billion stars, and we haven't even mapped more than 1% of these stars very accurately. Uh, so there's a lot of starlight that you're seeing in the sky up above your head. But you can think about the stars that actually look twinkly. They are actually the stars that are quite close by. They're within a local bubble relatively near planet Earth. The Milky Way stars themselves are much, much further away, but because there's so many of them, you just see this beautiful mess of dust and light on the sky. So rather pretty. Um, now, 
I'm just going to turn my Milky Way down a little bit and we'll get into some of the other things that Stellarium allows us to do. Um, now, one of the nicest things you can do when you are stargazing, I'll talk about the planets in a little while, you can see Jupiter just hanging there in the sky, is talk about the constellations. So really easily you can draw on all of the lines that we join the dots with in the sky. Now these patterns, our ancestors have been sort of mapping the sky and telling stories about these patterns in the sky for a very long time. And uh, you may disagree with what our ancestors uh, decided was going on up above our heads. So there's a lot of influences in here from the ancient Greeks, uh, Arabic and Islamic astronomy is in here as well, depending on what culture uh, you want to talk about, there's actually completely different interpretations of these patterns. Uh, the important thing is, is it's just helping us memorize the shapes of these patterns on the sky. Everything in space is moving, but because these stars are so far away from us uh, on the space of a human lifetime, these patterns are not going to change. So once you've memorized a few of the brighter ones, they'll stick with you for the rest of your life. Uh, right now, we're actually looking towards a constellation called uh, Pegasus, and we can tell it's Pegasus because it's got a big square of stars on the sky. Uh, you can use Stellarium to draw in the names of the constellations. Uh, you can even draw in the artwork. So um, for some reason, the ancient Greeks had uh, flying horse Pegasus upside down on the sky, and they didn't even give Pegasus uh, the rear quarters, there's actually a princess Andromeda and they share a star together on the sky. It's a really nice way of, of learning these patterns. I'm just going to turn off the artwork here and we'll turn off uh, the names of the constellations. Uh, this is a good chance to point out maybe the most useful thing I'd want any new stargazer to be able to see in the sky, and that's actually how to find the North Star. Just by a cosmic fluke, this star happens to be the most useful star in the sky, just sits in a really handy spot. And to find the North Star, we actually have to head ourselves towards the north. And we are looking for a constellation called Ursa Major. More specifically, we're looking for the bright pattern called the Plough that sits inside Ursa Major. The reason the Plough gets its own nickname is it's much easier to spot than the whole constellation of Ursa Major. And normally Ursa Major is a big bear. Uh, and so what we're really talking about here is the bear's bottom. And yes, I, I will mention the bear's bottom often in the planetarium too. So I'll get rid of my bear, get rid of my constellation. Uh, and the Plough itself is these seven bright stars. Uh, and even through city light pollution, you will be able to see this pattern of stars on the sky. It never sets from Scotland, so it doesn't matter what time of year or what time of night, if the stars are up, you're going to see the plough somewhere on the sky. Now, what we're going to do here is find the plough and use the two stars on the far right hand side. Imagine it's like a saucepan, uh, so you've got the handle here and the bucket here, uh, and you draw a straight line from those two stars from bottom to top. The first bright star you come to after following that straight line, that will be the star known as Polaris or the North Star. Uh, and I can show you why it's so useful. Um, in Stellarium, if you press the T key, it will start tracking on something. So it always sits in the center of the view. And I'm just going to speed up time a little bit, slowly at first, maybe a bit faster. And you can actually see this, uh, everything is moving in the sky. And this is just because the Earth is rotating. It's the reason the sun moves around us every day. Every 24 hours, the Earth completes one full circle. Uh, but the North Star just happens to sit right up above the Earth's North Pole, all the way out in space on the end of that pencil, if you put it through the Earth. Uh, but it just happens to never go anywhere because the Earth is tracing a circle. And because it's so close to where our North Pole is in the sky, it will always be in the same spot. So it's incredibly useful to navigators. And you can double check that it is North because you can see the big red in just underneath it on the sky. All right, let's bring us back to where we were. And um, uh, let's have a little look at what planets are up right now. So we have uh, three planets visible, uh, and I'm going to take a little peek at planet Saturn. I'm just going to make a couple of tweaks because you'll notice on the left hand side, all of this information is incredibly nerdy, but it can sometimes get in the way if you just want to have a pretty view of the night sky. So we can actually turn that off using this configuration window. There's an information panel, selected object information, and we're going to get rid of it all. Um, it's quite handy if you want to know the distance to things or exactly how high it is in the sky, but for most purposes, you don't really need it. Maybe just an identifier. Uh, for my sky options, I'm just going to turn off some labels here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to press T, so we're tracking Saturn, and then I am going to zoom in on Saturn. Nice and slow to begin with. And as we get closer and closer and closer, oh, I can see a couple of satellites moving through the sky here. Now, on average, you're going to see about one satellite a minute when you're stargazing. I don't really have time to talk about satellites at the moment, but uh, we can come back to that if there's time at the end. I'm zooming in a bit more on Saturn, and I want to get close enough 
until you see the thing that I really want to see. Now, it's going to be hard to make out on your screen, but if you were using a small telescope from Earth, this is what you would see if you pointed at Saturn. One bright moon on the left hand side, that is the moon Titan. It's the biggest moon that orbits around Saturn right now, but the planet itself um, uh, when it was first discovered, it got uh, written down that it looked like a planet with ears, and we can just see a hint in this view of Saturn's amazing ring system. And to be able to zoom in, we're cheating now because you can't really get views like this from down here on Earth, uh, but Saturn looking absolutely stunning in the nighttime sky. Those rings are left over from something that wandered a bit too close, we think, to planet Saturn, and it's millions upon millions of rocky, icy things all spread out in a really thin disk, but it's great at catching the sunlight. Very, very pretty views and you get classic sci-fi shots when you zoom in on Saturn. And we'll come away from Saturn and we'll have a look at what you have been seeing in the evening sky for uh, the last few months. So hopefully you've all clocked this at some point on your way home. Uh, hopefully the skies have been clear. It's planet Jupiter and right now it's uh, really bright and obvious for us in the nighttime sky. It's quite high too, which makes it nice for us to see. We zoom in on Jupiter and again the view you would get in a small telescope Instead of one moon, like Titan this time, we can actually see four moons around Jupiter. They are the four biggest. Jupiter has a whole bunch of moons, as does Saturn, but these are the four you can see quite easily, even with binoculars from here on Earth. Uh, they're the Galilean moons. And if we zoom in a little bit more, you'll see Jupiter proper. Now, Jupiter is one of the gas giants. Uh, just like Saturn, it's made of mostly gas. There's no solid surface we could walk on. Uh, you would just sink until you were squished. Uh, but it does look incredibly pretty in the nighttime sky. Now, once you get more comfortable with Stellarium, you can start to do some really interesting things here, like speeding up time and watching the moons of Jupiter orbit around the planet like fireflies. And this is what Galileo did when he pointed a telescope at this planet for the first time. He realized that Jupiter had its own family of moons. And what we're doing here is proving that the Earth is not the center of everything in the universe, because you can clearly see Jupiter has its own family of moons. And we can even zoom in on Jupiter to see the moon tracking across the face of the planet and its shadow there on the surface of this world as well. So you can have a little bit of fun, get a little bit nerdy, uh, and see if you can spot things like this uh, from Earth as well. So nerdy is the key here. And just doing a little bit more, because uh, there's one last planet I would like to see, and that is planet Mars, looking nice and orange and bright and high. Uh, just recently, the moon passed really close to Mars in the sky as well. And Mars is only about half the size of planet Earth, but it is another one of the rocky planets. And from Earth, it is the easiest one to visit after the moon. Um, it's quite exciting, too, because right now there's three active rovers that are driving around on the surface of Mars today. The reason Mars looks a little bit red is its soil is ever so slightly rusty, and that turns it this lovely rusty orangey colour in the nighttime sky as well. Yeah, just zooming out a little bit more. I've got a wee bit more time. What I'm going to do is point out my favourite object in the entire night sky. And the reason I want you to see this is because right now everything we've been looking at is either part of our solar system or part of our Milky Way, our home galaxy. There is one thing in the sky you can see without any help uh, that actually exists outside our galaxy. And that one thing is called the Andromeda Galaxy. It's the furthest away object in the sky. And it's a little bit hard to find. Uh, but to do this, I'm going to just switch the constellations back on. And what we're looking for is we've got the great square of Pegasus in front of us again. Uh, and what I'd also like to look for is a W shape of stars in the sky. And that W is a constellation called Cassiopeia. Um, once you've recognised that W, this is a really good one. It's really high at this time of year, but it also acts a little bit like an arrow for us. And it points toward the object that I would like to be able to see in the sky. And that object is called the Andromeda Galaxy. So I'm just going to turn off the atmosphere. And there's Andromeda there. So I'm going to zoom in just a little bit more. The object I'm looking for, we're actually using the W shape of Cassiopeia to point us roughly in the direction of the Great Square of Pegasus. And can you see there's that tiny fuzzy smudge? That fuzzy smudge is incredibly underwhelming, like really, really hard to see with your own eyes. You need to have very, very good skies. And I know it's underwhelming, but that is the furthest away thing you could ever see with your own eyes. Now, the light coming from all of these objects travels at the speed of light. It's incredibly fast, uh, a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but it's a really nice way of measuring distances in the sky because you can time how long it takes the light to get from one place to another. And it's a really nice way of keeping an idea of how far away we're getting. So to give you an example, 
Light moves fast enough that you could go seven times around the Earth in one second. You can get from the Earth to the Moon in about one and a quarter seconds. You can get to uh, the outer gas giant planets in hours. You can get to the next nearest stars in years. Uh, but the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years away at the speed of light. And so when you're catching that light from that tiny fuzzy smudge, hundreds of billions of stars all shining for you and making it all the way across to us here. Uh, but humans weren't even walking the surface of planet Earth uh, when the light left the Andromeda galaxy. So you're seeing some old light there, but it's a nice one to point out. There's one other group of things I'm going to point out before James tells me I'm talking for too long. Uh, which is an interesting object in the sky called Stefan's Quintet. Now, I'm only going to show you the underwhelming view here. We're just going to zoom in a little bit more because Andromeda is two and a half million light years away. But can you see the tiny fuzzy smudge in front of us here? The galaxies there are uh, around about 300 million light years away. And you're going to need a telescope to see that. But I've got a couple more pictures to show you just before we finish. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to switch on something completely different, which is turn on the shooting stars. Uh, now, with shooting stars inside Stellarium, you can actually just turn them up to 11, uh, and you should see plenty of them on the sky. Now, I'm hoping you've all seen shooting stars before, uh, but what you're seeing there is a streak of light moving across the sky incredibly fast. Uh, that tiny streak of light is usually caused by something very small. It's a leftover tiny piece of rock or dirt or dust. Uh, there's a lot of that left around in our solar system, and every so often the Earth smacks into these fast-moving tiny things. They're not much bigger than about the size of a grain of rice, but they're moving so fast that friction, just as it meets the Earth's atmosphere, imagine just heating up your hand in a cold winter night, that's enough to send that tiny little piece of space rock on fire and you see it burn up in the sky up above your head. Right now we actually have a meteor shower happening which is something called the Geminids uh, and there's a constellation Gemini and it actually appears that the meteors are coming from roughly that direction in the sky. The longer you spend under a dark sky uh, the more chance you have of being able to see some of those shooting stars. Um, now what's also quite fun is that uh, I actually happen to be holding uh, a rock that's not from Earth in my hand at the moment. So uh, you don't have to uh, wait to see shooting stars in the sky to be able to see you've seen one. You can actually go and buy a piece of shooting star that you can hold in your hand. So let me just turn off my screen sharing. And we'll come back to the slides as well. And uh, before I do that, I'm just going to show you this rock here. So this right here, quite a chunky one, uh, fist sized. Uh, and that's big enough where it gets a little bit cooked on the outside, falls to Earth, and you can actually hold it in your hand. Now, the oldest uh, geological rocks you can find on Earth are maybe a couple of billion years old, maybe slightly older, depending on uh, who you talk to. Uh, but these predate everything. So they're the oldest things you can ever possibly get your hand on. And they formed around about the same time planet Earth did, so around about four and a half billion years ago. So an incredibly old piece of perspective that you can hold in your hand there as well. But that's not from planet Earth. I'm just going to bring the slides back couple last quick things to mention because I was talking about hooks uh, and one of the things I love to do is I love to show something as current as possible. Uh, so what you're seeing here with this picture of the sun, this was the sun uh, taken by a NASA spacecraft, which spends all day every day taking pictures of your home star. This is what it looked like at 11 o'clock today. Uh, and the website is fantastic. You can actually download the last 24 hours of what the sun looked like in lots of different filters. So you'll see different colors, different things going on in the sun's atmosphere. Just to give you an idea of scale, if the Earth is one footstep across, you've got to walk 109 footsteps to mark out just how wide your home star is. So it's a nice way of getting a bit of perspective when you see images like this on the sky. Uh, another website I went to today, uh, a picture of Mars as it looked like uh, yesterday for one of the rovers that's driving around on the surface of Mars. This is the Perseverance rover and you can see in the background there's actually a cliff face there and um, the rover is currently exploring the bottom of an old Martian lake bed. We know there was water here. There's features this rover is exploring that were carved by moving water and layers of sediment laid down by an old Martian lake. So really interesting stuff coming back from Mars at the moment. But it's just nice that you can go and see what the weather was like on Mars yesterday. Um, the last thing I'm going to show you uh, connects to Christmas in a way, uh, and it's actually the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Remember that object, Stefan's Quintet, that I was pointing at in Stellarium? Five galaxies very, very close together on the sky, incredibly hard to see, but it just so happens the movie It's a Wonderful Life starts with that same patch of sky. Uh, so there's a little crossfade from what's in the movie to a more modern photographic play, but photographic plates 
also quite old fashioned way of imaging the sky. So recently uh, we have uh, as bragging rights for us here in Scotland, the James Webb Space Telescope or just Webb for short. Some of my friends at the observatory in Edinburgh actually designed and built one of the main instruments or at least a piece of it that's sitting on the back of this telescope right now. Uh, and Webb imaged this patch of sky as well. So these days, this is the absolute best I could possibly show you of this view. Um, now, I'm going to leave you with that view and then I'm going to hand back to James. I just about kept to time, James, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat as well. So if you have any more questions for me, please let me know. How was I doing? Did I leave anybody in the dark? Uh, but otherwise, good luck with Stellarium and I'll maybe see you later on as well. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ali. Yes, so um, we're going to have a break now. Um, thanks to those of you that have just joined in between. Um, this session is going to be Ali's talk that hopefully you can catch up on if you've missed some of it online later on. Uh, we're going to do a little story storytelling session after our break next. Then after that, we'll have another break and we'll talk about some useful resources. So while we have five minutes break, um, come back at 25 to 5. Uh, but in the meantime, if you've got any questions at all, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. Thanks so much.
All right, everyone. So thanks for joining us again. If you joined us mid through uh, the session with Ali there, uh, we're going to do something a bit different now. And we're going to do 25 minutes of storytelling. Uh, now, this is a planetarium show, actually, that we do here at Dynamic Earth. Uh, but I'm going to try our best to distill it online. Um, and I'm going to pitch it to early years P1, P2 sort of level. So I'm about to go into full storytelling mode. And uh, so this should last about 25 minutes. But again, if you have any thoughts about uh, my delivery during the, the storytelling, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, perhaps you particularly enjoyed some moments. Uh, perhaps there's something that you'd want to do differently. Uh, we're talking about pitching it perfectly today. Uh, I am not going to pretend that I ever do it perfectly. Uh, there'll be things I do well, there'll be things I don't do well, and um, there might be things you want to change. So uh, we're going to get started with our You Are Here story, which is a story that involves all of us. It's the story of planet Earth and our place in the universe. To do this, I'm just going to end sharing the PowerPoint, and I'm going to share my other screen, which will bring a piece of planetarium software on to show you our show here. So it's got to do. All right, so you can probably see all the behind the scenes stuff at the moment, and I'm going to go onto my piece of software just here. And we'll get started. OK, so welcome everyone today. My name is James and I am an astronomer. Do any of you know what an astronomer means at all? That's right, I love space. I really love studying space, looking at space, uh, enjoying pictures from space, and talking about space travel. And we're going to do a lot of that today. But can any of you point towards space and where it might be? Where is space? That's right, it's above us, it's all above our heads. So we're going to begin our story today, which is called You Are Here. And we're going to end up in space and explore our solar system. We may see some planets. What else might we see? We, we might see some stars. We might see some galaxies. And we'll talk about what they are in a little moment too. But to begin with, we're going to start off somewhere where astronomers might go to get a good look at space. And to get a better view of space, we might use something called a telescope in our observatory. So this is traditionally where astronomers might go to use a really big telescope, point it out towards space and look at some stars or some galaxies or some planets. Let's open up these big doors and we'll take a look at what's outside. Only we're not going to use a telescope today because we're going to leave the observatory. We can use a bit of magic here to travel anywhere we'd like to in space and in time. So of course, we're going to begin outside. It's a wonderful, clear, sunny, blue sky in Edinburgh. And to show you a bit more of Edinburgh here, we're just going to tilt ourselves forwards. We can have a look around and see what's around us here. You might notice some hills. We've got some houses. We've got the blue sky. We've got the sun as well. But as we tilt forwards, you're going to realise we're already a little bit above the ground. We're about 100 metres up. So if you're a bit scared of heights, and don't worry, I am too, just hold on. We can see a building beneath us. This white building is Dynamic Earth, and that's where we work. But hold on, everyone. We're not going to stay here for long. We're going to take off and start climbing higher and higher and higher. And as we do, it's a great chance to nosy at where everyone lives, but we can also see some famous sites in front of us too. So we've got Edinburgh Castle somewhere just down here at the front. And as we keep climbing higher and higher and higher, we're going to tilt ourselves to face towards the west. Now, over in the west, we have that great big river that runs through Edinburgh, the Firth of Forth. There's a few bridges that run across there, too. But now we're much, much higher up. We find ourselves 10 kilometres above the ground. That's pretty high. And the reason we're at this height is because if you've ever been on an aeroplane before, this is how high you will have been. 10 kilometres. Now, this could be the highest you ever go above your home planet. To go higher than this, we need to do something a bit different. We can't use a plane to go higher than this. What might we want to use to go higher? A bicycle? No, we can't use it. We can't cycle to space. Um, we can't use a scooter either. A rocket. Yes, we're going to use a rocket. So everyone, before we get into our rockets, are we dressed? Are we prepared to go into space? No. So I'd like you all to get onto your space trousers. 
Put on your space jacket here, get your space gloves on, your space helmets. Cha-ching! Visors down as well. Zoop. Okay, I think we're pretty much ready to go into space. But of course, as we get into our rockets, before we lift off, we need a countdown. So, from five, four, three, two, one, blast off! And as we set off in our rocket, which is launching from Edinburgh, which doesn't usually happen, we can feel the vibrations of those rocket engines roaring beneath our feet. We're perfectly safe though, we're strapped into this little tin can, and we can start to see that the sky is getting darker and darker and darker. And that's because as we get higher and higher up, we're starting to go into the upper reaches of our sky, and we call that our atmosphere. OK, so as we approach 70 kilometres above planet Earth now, we're facing in a different direction. We're facing towards the north and in front of us, we might just be able to see Orkney and Shetland. But as you're looking there, I wonder if you can spot any stars. Hmm. No, there's not any stars and that's because we're not quite in space just yet. To get into space and stay there, we have to escape a force called gravity. And to escape that force, we actually have to get going much, much faster in our rocket. So to do that, in our rocket, going faster would usually take eight minutes. But I can use a bit more magic to press this button here and get us into space in just about a minute. So here we go. I'm going to press the button. And as we press that button, we need to send ourselves into something called an orbit. Now, an orbit is where we need to get going so fast to escape that pull of gravity and basically fall around and around and around planet Earth. And when we're doing that, we can stay in space and we can see lots of wonderful things. So as we start going into our orbit here, you might begin to see some stars. You might be able to see a little bit of a green glow. We're going to talk about what that, that is in a moment as well. We'll start to see some of those stars coming into view. And we can see the thin blue line of the Earth's atmosphere. So atmosphere is a big word that has all of the air that we need in there to be able to breathe and live on planet Earth. More and more stars coming into view and we begin to make it up here into space. Now have a good look around in front of you. What can you see now that we're up here in space? We've got lots and lots of stars in front of us. But we've also got that wonderful green glow. That is something called the Earth's aurora. Or you might know of it called the northern lights. And weirdly, the northern lights are caused by the sun burping. Yes, uh, the sun burps out, not food, because that would be a bit disgusting, Oof. but it does burp out charged particles. They're called electrons, as another big word. And electrons come whizzing past from the sun. They enter the Earth's air sometimes and they cause our air to glow this wonderful green colour. And sometimes you can even see this from Scotland. So fingers crossed you might see it one day. Sometimes you can also see the Milky Way. You might not be able to see it in front of you now, but the Milky Way is this dusty, bright trail of light across the sky. And in that direction are millions and millions of stars. But about to come into view in front of us, you might just be able to see the moon. And that is where we're going to go next. So in a moment, the moon is going to rise up above planet Earth. Here it comes. And that is our next destination. Now, again, we're going to use a bit of magic here to fly straight towards the moon. We're going to shimmy through the atmosphere, cut a few corners, break some rules to fly there quicker than anyone has flown there before. Here we go. But before we go and have a close look at the moon, I'd like us just to take a little pause and just have a look back at how far we've already travelled in our rocket, because we've already gone quite a long way. Now, just then, looking at the Earth's northern lights, we were somewhere called low Earth orbit. But we're a bit further away now. To show you just how far we've travelled into space, I'm going to be a little bit silly. I'm going to wrap planet Earth here in a giant soap bubble. There it is. Now, at the moment, this bubble is about 100 kilometres above the surface of planet Earth. That's the dividing line between Earth and space. So if you want to get into space, you've got to break that bubble. But 
remember, we were just in low Earth orbit. So let's have a look at where that is. Oh, um, it's a bit further away, but to be honest, we're still hugging planet Earth pretty closely there, aren't we? Turns out, though, that every astronaut that goes into space these days does not go further than this bubble. They don't go outside it. So whether it's the astronauts up on the International Space Station right now, which is about the size of a football pitch, and that orbits around planet Earth, they usually have six astronauts on board. Whether you've been on a space shuttle as an astronaut, we don't use those anymore, but we did a few years ago, or other rockets, Soyuz capsules, all of those things did not go beyond this bubble. In fact, just 24 people have ever traveled further than this into space. And the last of them to do so did it 50 years ago today. These were the Apollo astronauts that went to the moon. So to show you just how far they journeyed, we've got to zoom out a bit actually to bring the moon into view. Now it's gonna be a little bit hard to see because the moon reflects sunlight and it's not reflecting much sunlight in front of us here. You might just be able to see it. And we're gonna bring back that bubble now and see just how far those Apollo astronauts journeyed. Way further. You can barely see the Earth now. It's that tiny little marble in the middle. But those Apollo astronauts had to go pretty much all the way to the edge of that bubble to get to the moon. Now, I can see we've got lots of budding astronauts in front of us this afternoon. And maybe one day one of you would like to give this bubble a bit of a pop and go even further into space. Perhaps to a planet. How cool would that be? No one's ever done that yet. But for now, I did promise a good look at the moon. And that is where we're going to go next. In fact, we're going to do a bit of time travel and go back to the year 1968. Christmas Eve 1968 on the Apollo 8 mission. Now, these astronauts didn't land on the moon. That was a year later with Apollo 11. But what they did do is they orbited around the moon making maps of the surface of all the craters and they were doing this when they noticed something just peeking up above the surface there can you see that what might that be yeah that's planet earth that is us so these astronauts got their camera and they took a photo of this moment and here comes that photo it's called Earthrise, and the reason this picture is so famous is because it's one of the most distant pictures of our planet ever taken with a human being behind the camera. That's what makes it so special, because we are going to see more pictures of our home planet today, and they'll be taken by, they'll be real pictures, but they won't be taken by people, they'll be taken by robots or by spacecraft. Next up, though, we're about to go further away. We're going to go to our first planet. And this planet, you might want to have a guess which planet do you think it might be? It's a little bit dusty. Have a think. Begins with a ma. Well done if you said Mars. And just about to peek up its head is the Curiosity Mars rover. Now, this is a robot about the size of a small car that you might have at home. It's got wheels on the bottom, like a car, so it can drive around and explore Mars. But it also has a drill, and it can use that drill to dig into Mars and explore some of its rocks and see what they're made of. But my favourite thing that Curiosity has is its selfie stick. It takes selfies all the time. It takes these pictures, puts them online, and they're well worth a look if you've got permission with your teachers. Some amazing photos. But on this night back in the year 2014, Curiosity turned its camera around and took this picture of us, planet Earth. And I wonder if you can see if you can spot us in this picture. Now, if you have already, really well done. But if you haven't, don't worry, we can zoom in and get a better look. And we're now so far away that we're just this tiny little speck of light on the Martian sky. So there's us, planet Earth, and that tiny little speck beneath us is the moon. But before we go and explore anywhere else, I think we should meet the rest of the neighbours. So let's go on a whistle-stop tour through all eight planets of our solar system. Not nine. I've not included Pluto. It's a dwarf planet and it's got its own family of dwarf planets these days. But maybe we'll meet it another day. For now, though, here come the eight planets of our solar system. And you can see three of them already in front of us. The one right in the middle there is the closest planet to the sun. Shout out if you know it. 
Yeah, that's Mercury. So Mercury is the closest planet to the sun and it does look a bit like the moon. So don't worry if you thought it was the moon. The reason they look similar is because Mercury, just like the moon, does not have an atmosphere. It's, got, it's not got any air to breathe. Because of that, one side of Mercury is very, very hot. The other side of Mercury is very, very cold. Now, next up, we've got the second closest planet to the sun, and this one is called Venus. Venus is very different to Mercury because it has a really thick atmosphere. It's got lots and lots of air and that traps in the heat. So it's a bit like a big space blanket or a duvet trapping all of the heat in, keeping Venus nice and snug, raising the temperature there. Very, very hot, about 500 degrees. Can you imagine 500 degrees? That's about twice as hot as your oven back home. We would almost certainly melt. So we're not going to go there for long. In fact, we're going to visit the third rock from the sun, planet Earth. You might recognize this one, hopefully that's our planet and it's my favorite planet because it has everything that we need to survive. It's got oceans, it's got vegetables, but my favorite thing that Earth has is its air that allows us to breathe. I mean, how good's that? Uh, hands up if you like breathing, by the way. Me too. If you don't like breathing, that's okay. We've got a planet for you. Next up, we have Mars. Uh, Mars is a bit rusty, it's a bit dusty, and it's a little bit red, maybe a bit brown too. It looks like this great big desert out there in space, but it isn't a hot planet, it's actually quite cold. If you look closely at Mars, in a moment you might see a little white patch. That white patch is ice, and it's actually a frozen carbon dioxide ice. What do I mean by that? I mean it's not water that's frozen, it's a weird gas that's frozen. Now for that to happen, it needs to be very, very cold, about minus 50 degrees on average. So we definitely have to take our coats to go to Mars. We're gonna move on to some different worlds next because we have four places that you can't step foot on. All of these planets are made of gas. And this one in front of us is the biggest of them all. It's called Jupiter. It's one of the gas giant planets. Now, Jupiter is really, really pretty. It's got all of these swirly clouds of different colors, all of these storms going on. In fact, you might just be able to see coming into view Jupiter's great red spot. That storm is about the size of planet Earth and it's been going on for about 200 years. Such a long time. Now, after Jupiter, we have my second favorite planet and you might recognize this one. This is Saturn with its amazing rings. Those rings are made up of millions of bits of rock and ice and dust, all orbiting around Saturn, reflecting the sun's light. There, we have two very icy planets. We've got Uranus in front of us, which spins on its side, which is a bit strange. And then just to the right there, we have Neptune, which is the most distant planet, but Neptune is not the coldest. That is Uranus, even though it's not the furthest planet away. So let's just go through the planets again and we'll count how many there are. So we have, we'll skip through Neptune. <laughs> so we've got Mercury, you can repeat after me if you like, Venus, number two. Then we've got Earth, planet number three. Mars, number four. Those are the rocky planets. Five is Jupiter, the first of the gas giants. Saturn, number six. Uranus, number seven. And finally, Neptune, number eight. So those are the eight planets of our solar system. But they're not all the same size, so we're going to put them to the right sizes here. Some of them will shrink down, and I'm going to float them all to the front so we can see them all here. And we'll take a bit of a family photo of all the eight planets together in our solar system. Now, just like family members, each one's a bit unique from each other. Um, some look a bit different. They're different colours. They're different sizes. And there they are, the eight planets of our solar system. But next up, I'm going to show you something a bit different. I'm going to take you to my favourite planet, my second favourite planet, because planet Earth is my favourite, but my favourite planet that isn't planet Earth we mentioned is Saturn. So I'm going to take you on a trip to Saturn and we're going to meet a spacecraft that lived there for 13 years. That's such a long time. That's like double your lifetime. I can't imagine what that would be like to live there for so long. But we're not going to spend 13 years living around Saturn. Instead, we're going to follow this spacecraft's journey for just two weeks, sped up into two minutes. And this spacecraft has a special name. It's called Cassini. Let's see what Cassini saw as it lived around Saturn.
Now, when you first look at Saturn in front of you, you might be able to see these tiny little bright dots that look like they're dancing in kind of around Saturn there. Those are some of Saturn's moons. Saturn has 83 discovered moons. That's a lot. I mean, here on Earth, we have one moon, don't we? And we call it the moon. Great, good name. But around Saturn, there are so many moons, we had to come up with all these different names and I can't fit them all in. So I'm just showing you the biggest, the brightest or the closest ones here. Now, as we go edge on with Saturn, the rings almost look like they disappear. Oh, and did you just see a moon? We got very, very close to Titan there. Titan is Saturn's largest moon. And it's so big, it has an atmosphere. It has air of its own. It's the only moon we know of to have air. Now, as we get closer to Saturn here, we start to enter Saturn's shadow. So that is where the sun is out of the way on the other side. It's not shining on this side. And as we enter Saturn's shadow, it starts to get a bit darker. But in this position, Cassini, that spacecraft, took lots and lots of photos, hundreds of pictures of this view in front of us. And then it sent all of those pictures back to planet Earth for astronomers to put together into one big picture, one giant panorama. This is one of my favourite pictures ever taken in space. So I can't wait to show you all it in just a moment. Here we go. So here comes that picture. And it's really, really pretty. I hope you agree. But my favourite thing about this picture is that all of us here today are in this photo. If you look at that tiny little dot just there, that is planet Earth. I'm also waving in this picture, by the way. If you'd like to know how I did that, come ask me at the end and I'll reveal everything. But also in this picture, can you see this blue fuzzy ring? That ring is really strange. It's caused by water freezing into ice as it's spewed out from a volcano of one of Saturn's moons, an icy volcano. Now, we're not going to stop there. We're about to go even further into space. We're going to meet a spacecraft that didn't just visit one planet, it visited four. It was a bit greedy. And we're now so far away from all the planets that we can't even make them out anymore. We can't really see them. So what we're about to have a look at is a bird's eye view of the solar system. Each of these lines that you see is a path that a planet takes as it orbits around the sun in the middle. The lines aren't real. It's just to help us see how the planets move. So I'll just point out that here is Jupiter. There is Saturn. Down here is Uranus, and all the way at the bottom of your screen is Neptune. And I'm going to start time moving back in the year 1977. So we're traveling further back in time because this spacecraft that launched from planet Earth back in 1977, and you can just see its journey here, is called Voyager 2. Voyager 2 wanted to visit all of the gas giant planets, so it's about to get to Jupiter there, and as it gets to Jupiter, it's taking some of the best pictures that people have seen of Jupiter and its moons that people have ever seen back in the 1970s. But then it got a bit of a speed boost and it headed towards Saturn, where it took more pictures, really impressive ones, and got another huge speed boost and started flinging itself all the way to Uranus. Now, how it manages to do this, how Voyager hops between the planets, as it approaches each one, it gets a little bit of a kick, a speed boost from that planet's gravity, that force that we talked about earlier. And now it's on its way to Neptune. To this day, it's the only spacecraft that's ever visited both Uranus and Neptune, which makes it really special. But... It's not the spacecraft I really want to talk to you about, because that would be Voyager 1. And you might be thinking, well, James, you've been a bit silly here. One, one comes before two. So why did you talk about Voyager 2 before Voyager 1? Well, maybe astronomers aren't very good at counting. I'm not really sure. But here it comes. Voyager 1 got such a big boost of speed from Saturn that it actually missed Uranus. It missed Neptune. And it soared past the solar system. So here it comes. 
it swings past Uranus, goes all the way past Neptune, right to the outer reaches of our solar system, really, really far away. And from there, an astronomer asked it to do something a little bit different. They asked this spacecraft to turn around and take one last photo of home. So what we're all about to see is the most distant, furthest away picture of planet Earth, our home, ever taken. Be prepared to just be a little bit disappointed. Can you see us in this photo? Can you spot planet Earth? No. <laughs> But that's OK, because we're going to zoom in. And as we zoom in, just like astronomers do with telescopes to get a better view, we're going to see if we can spot planet Earth. An astronomer called Carl Sagan once described us in this photo as a little tiny mote of dust in a sunbeam. So we're very, very small. I wonder if you can spot us. Yes, we're just coming into view with that tiny little speck of light there. And on that speck of light, everyone you know your friends, your family, maybe your pets, my pet guinea pig. Everyone who ever lived out their lives lived on that pale blue dot. And it's such an incredible reminder of how small we are in this huge universe we just happen to find ourselves in. Now, Voyager 1, that spacecraft is still going. It's getting further and further away from planet Earth and we can still talk to it, which is a lot of fun, but it's running out of battery, so it's not able to take another picture like that one anymore. Even though it's the furthest spacecraft we've ever put into space, it's nowhere near close to the next nearest star. So what I mean by that is that the sun is our star. We see it in the sky every day, though it's really important not to look directly at the sun because it can damage your eyes. But the next nearest star, maybe with its own planets, is really, really far away. And we're nowhere near close sending a spacecraft there. It could take a very, very long time. So I'm very aware that there's still a lot of universe for all of us to see today. And with that in mind, I'm going to press a few buttons to reset things. Now, the moral of this story is that no matter how far you journey, it's always a good idea once in a while to turn around and look back at where you started. So we're going to head back to planet Earth head back to Edinburgh, back to Dynamic Earth, and we're going to find ourselves hovering above Dynamic Earth here. Because in front of me, I've got a button that if I press it, will switch on the rest of the universe. We'll see everything in space that we have yet to see so far. What do you think? Shall I press the button? Yeah, OK. So as I press this button, we're going to move backwards and get faster and faster and faster and I'll point out Voyager 1 on the way too. So hold on everyone, here we go. So quite fast, fast we take off here from Dynamic Earth. We can see some of those hills, Arthur's seats, we wave goodbye. We wave goodbye to Scotland here, although we're a bit upside down. There goes planet Earth. a bit cloudy, but there goes our planet, our pale blue dots. There goes the moon. And here comes the rest of our solar system. So all of those planets that we met earlier. Lots of those dots there are rocks in our solar system. And that little marker is Voyager 1, the furthest spacecraft we've ever sent into space. That's how far we've got. We keep going, we're flying and zooming past all of these stars. And these stars are in our galaxy. A galaxy is like a city for stars where loads and loads of them live together. And our galaxy is the Milky Way. And here it comes. It looks a bit like a spiral or a cartwheel out there in space. It's very bright in the center. But we keep going here past our galaxy, past the Milky Way. And I wonder what we'll see here. Other galaxies out there in space, because there isn't just one. I wonder if you can count how many galaxies you can see. I can't. <laughs> I'm starting to lose track. Oh, wow. Here come so many galaxies. There's too many to count, and we're still going faster and faster through all of these galaxies, all looking a bit different. Some look like spirals, some are blobbier, 
They come in different shapes and sizes, just like other things in space. And out of all of these galaxies in the universe, we finally get to see that you are here. That is our place in the universe. And that brings us to the end of our journey through space today and the end of our story. So thank you so much, everyone. And let me know if you've got any questions. OK, so <laughs> I hope that was all right. Um, please feel free to put in the chat any comments at all, any criticisms, any suggestions, any things you did like, any questions at all. Uh, but again, we'll have another five minute break before I hand over to Tony and she'll chat to you about lots of space resources. So go have a cup of tea. I'm going to switch off the camera here and the mic. And I'll see you at 10 past five. Thanks a lot.
All right, everyone. Uh, so that was our final break. And I'm going to hand you over now to Tony, who's going to talk through lots of useful resources um, that we like and some suggestions uh, for things that you could use in your classroom. OK. Hi there, folks. Thanks, James. I'm Tony. And yeah, just as James said, I'm going to show you some of my favourite resources from when I was teaching and things that I still like to use now. First up, as you can see on the slides, I'm going to blow our own trumpet a bit. We've got the Dynamic Earth online. I've chosen our space page because that's my favourite thing. There's lots of really useful information, some profiles of some of our favourite scientists and lots of activities for you to get your teeth into in the classroom as well. On each of these slides, there's a link to the website itself, or you can just Google us as well. Nice and simple. Next up is what Ali was using earlier. Stellarium or Stellarium, as Ali says, it's super useful. He's already shown you lots of the things that you can do with Stellarium. He showed you some of the constellations. He showed you some planets and their moons. You can look at stars. You can see galaxies, nebulae, exoplanets, planets in other solar systems. You can see some of the satellites. In particular, you can also use it to find the International Space Station and to look at when it will be passing overhead. Well worth doing. It's passing over at the moment. So last week it was going over about half past four, which is great. You can tell your kids after you've walked home, go back outside, take a look up, see if you can spot the International Space Station. You can also use Stellarium to learn about our moon. You can zoom right in on all of the craters and seas and see how lumpy bumpy it is. You can fast forward through time to see the moon phases and explain why the moon is sometimes different shapes in the sky. I love this little bit of software. It's completely free, really useful for explaining things like seasons as well. Next up. We've got these little cards. We take these away with us on Outreach quite a lot. Space 4D plus alternative reality cards. These you need a little iPad with. Hover over the cards and these items come to life. You can zoom in on them. You can move them around. Things like asteroids, the entire solar system, different galaxies, the International Space Station. Really great for getting a look from lots of different angles of all these weird and wonderful space objects. Definitely worth a look. This is a resource a little bit like Tez or Twinkle, but it's coming straight from physicists themselves. So the Institute of Physics, IOP Spark, you may have used these before. They have ready-made lesson plans, ready to go with resource lists as, lists as well. But my favourite thing on this website are their misconceptions lists. They have huge lists of common misconceptions for every subject you can imagine. So when I was flung into teaching chemistry or biology, heaven forfend, I would look at this page and they would have all the misconceptions that I might come up against in one of my lessons. Uh, that's my favourite thing on that IOP Spark page, uh, as well as all of the lessons that are made for you, for all age groups as well, from early years right up to A level. This is something that I absolutely love. It's, uh, it's called Borrow the Moon. And this lets you bring pieces of space rock, in particular the moon, into your classroom. This can be really useful for just handing to a student, letting them think about what they're seeing. How did that bit of moon rock get back to space? Was it blasted off by a piece of space rock crashing into the moon or did astronauts bring it back? Who's been to the moon? When did they go to the moon? Why did they bring bits of moon rock back? They also have a ready-made lesson plan to go for you. It's called Meteorite Hunters. You get a big box of rocks and a sorting activity. In there is a meteorite. Uh, and so you've got to look at rocks differently, try and work out which ones come from space and which different types of rocks you might find on Earth. I, in fact, have a piece of moon rock with me here. So this is one that we take on outreach with us. Just hand it to a child and say, what do you think that is? Eventually, they might work it out because we've usually got lots of space stuff around us. But otherwise, you can tell them what sort of things to look out for. 
and why they think it's from, from the moon or why they think it's from Earth. This is another lovely one for bringing that stuff into your classroom called Tactile Universe. This originally was set up to teach people with visual impairments more about space. This is Nick, he's the founder of Tactile Universe and uh, he 3D prints objects out in space. Things like galaxies, things that you might not really be able to learn much about if you have a visual impairment from just looking at photographs. These 3D prints allow people to feel the shapes of galaxies, things that they would never have known before. You can feel that galaxies have a big bulge in the middle of them, and some have spiral arms, and some are just completely random. If you have access to a 3D printer, you can print out every single model that they have made. It's completely free, all available on that website. If not, they have some models that they lend out to schools as well. They also run training sessions for teachers, uh, telling you how better to prepare your lessons for visually impaired students. They tell you things about the scale of our solar system and how to model that as well. Fantastic resource, definitely give them a look up. And here are a couple more things like Tez or Twinkle. So this is STEM learning, absolutely fantastic resource all science topics covered, all age ranges. You'll see that they're covered in the English school system, so year one, year two, year three, year five, but the ages line up and there are very, very, lots of overlap there uh, for uh, the sciences. Same again with these. So ESERO, E-S-E-R-O, is the European Space Agency in partnership with lots of country space agencies such as the UK Space Agency in partnership with lots of different schools to make this huge library of resources all based on things that the European Space Agency do. Things like Mars rovers, things like the James Webb Space Telescope that Ali mentioned earlier. So if you're looking for some European local space science and activities to go with it, this is a great one to go for. Same with UK SEDS. So the UK Students for Exploration and Development of Space, their resources started out as a COVID project. Uh, they usually went out to schools to do lots of workshops and then COVID happened and they couldn't do that anymore. So they've made this huge library of online resources, lesson plans, activities. And something I really like about this is you get a little laboratory book for every activity that you do and a certificate when you successfully complete it. So a lovely round lesson plan ready to go for you. And then on to some of our favourite books as well. So exploring space through stories. This is the one that we take away on outreach with our little inflatable planetarium. It's called Bringing Down the Moon and it comes with some of our friends here. We have Molly our little hand puppet, we've got Rabbit too, and we love this book because it just about gets the idea across that space is quite big and Mole, no matter how much you try, is never going to bring down the moon. But there's a lot of other things that we talk about going through this book as well, so we also talk about how some things give out light, like a torch or a candle, and we also talk about how some things reflect light, like a mirror or the moon. We find it really good fun to get pupils to decide whether something reflects light or gives out light. They always find that great fun as well, meeting all of the little friends too. Here are some of our other favourite books. So One Year with Kipper, I absolutely loved Mick and Inkpen growing up. He explores the different seasons, seeing the difference between cold, cold winter and sunny summer. And like Ali showed you in Stellarium, why is the sun higher up in the sky in the summer and really low in the sky during winter? Same with Night Monkey, Day Monkey. There are certain things that Night Monkey just doesn't understand about the daytime and Day Monkey doesn't understand about nighttime either. Why doesn't Night Monkey know what shadows are? There's so much science in this book. And finally, these last two are all of the stories about constellations. So zoo in the sky are all of the animals 
that we see up in the sky, like Leo the lion on the cover there. And Once Upon a Starry Night are all of those ancient Greek stories too. So lots of stories. You could pair that with Stellarium as well. So find a constellation, find its story, and learn about what came with it there. And this is probably for slightly older readers, Orion Lost. Uh, uh, Alistair actually did a book launch for this one, <laughs> giving, talking about all of the science involved here. So between P4, P7, this one is aimed at, and it has a whole host of learning resources to go with the book as well on this link. Definitely worth taking a look at that one. So hopefully you find some of these resources useful for you. I think a great resource that we happen to have here at Dynamic Earth, though, is our planetarium. So perhaps we're going to get James back in here, because if you don't want to do any stories at school or you don't want to get some moon rock in, we can do it for you. <laughs> do uh, come and visit us at our planetarium or if you don't want to come to us, we can come to you in our inflatable planetarium, too. Uh, we love doing it. It'd be very nice to see, uh, see you here. And that is, I hope you find those useful. And thanks very much for coming along. Back over to you, James. Cheers. Thanks so much, Tony. Uh, yes, as Tony touched upon, um, we have two planetariums. We've got one here at Dynamic Earth, uh, an inflatable one. So uh, do feel free to get in touch here if you do want to perhaps consolidate learning in the classroom through resources that you might find useful from today, or you want to introduce the topic um, we'd love to have you here, but we understand that perhaps sometimes it's difficult to get here, maybe too expensive, uh, and that's why we also have a, a mobile outreach planetarium program too. All right, so that pretty much brings us to the end of our CLPL session for this afternoon. Now's the time if you've got any questions at all. I just want to have a little chat. Uh, feel free to put in the chat. I'll give you maybe a minute or so to do that while I waffle on to the end. Um, but this is the end of our session. So just to remind then that at first we handed off to Ali and we use Stellarium. I think that's one of the key things to take away. Uh, if you've not heard of it before, it's a really great piece of software to use. Um, our storytelling session there, maybe you picked up some things that, uh, that you, some style that you liked or maybe disliked and it's informed your practice a little bit. And then lots of useful resources there at the end that you may not have heard of or you may have. Uh, but we're going to put all of those links to those things online, possibly in the description of this video when it's uploaded to YouTube. Um, so they'll all be there for you to come back to as we did whiz through that a little bit quickly. All right, so I'll just check the chat, but if there's nothing in the comments there, then thank you so much for coming. Uh, have a lovely week, uh, a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year if you celebrate it. Thank you so much and have a good evening. See you.